The five biggest facts about balance. Hi, my name is Doug. I've been a physical therapist for 30 years. In this video, I'm going to tell you the five biggest facts about balance that most people get wrong. Number five is you're not born with balance. That might seem like a funny thing to say, but it's true. You're born with a sense of smell, a sense of taste, a sense of vision, hearing, but you're not born with a sense of balance. Balance really is something that you program in. A child does not know how to balance itself. A child relies on other people to help it stand up and help the child start to challenge itself. Children will innately pull themselves up on the furniture or something nearby and try to stand. And it's that repeated practice of standing that teaches them their sense of balance. But over time, different people can attain different levels of balance. If you participate in sports, if you play football or basketball or do gymnastics, your ability to balance is going to be much better, superior to someone that doesn't do those activities. That's because balance, unlike hearing and vision and taste, is something that can get better and better and better with practice. The more you challenge your balance, the more you practice balancing, the better you get. So balance should not be thought of as an innate sense, as an innate thing that we simply have. Instead, you want to look at balance as something that can get better with practice and it's something that we, we originally got by challenging ourselves. Number four is that once balance is lost, it's lost forever. I hear this all the time. People who have trouble with their balance or who have kind of lost their ability to walk without an assistive device tell me once they lose it, they can't get that back again. I can tell you from 30 years of doing this that that's untrue. A lot of people that have lost their ability to balance, they can relearn to balance again. They can regain their stability. Time and time again, I see patients that have had strokes, that have head injuries, maybe they're just not practicing their balance enough to really maintain it, and they've lost their ability to balance without holding on to something. What I do with them is I help them safely challenge themselves and learn to do this again. When you challenge someone's balance, it gets incrementally better. A lot of times people give up too quickly. They'll do something like try to stand on one leg, find that they can't do it, and they just give up. They think, ah, oh, I can't get this back again. You can relearn balance. I've seen this process happen so many times that I'm convinced that pretty much anyone that's lost their ability to balance and who has a motivation to relearn it can. But that doesn't stop doctors and other people from telling you that really, once you've lost it, you have to give it up and be in a wheelchair or use a walker for the rest of your life. The number three biggest misconception is that the reason people lose their balance is strength. Many, many studies have looked at the question of whether or not strength is the reason that people lose their balance. In fact, if you look at the majority of balance programs, of fall prevention programs, they include strength training almost categorically. I have yet to see a balance program or a fall prevention program that doesn't have a very large strength training component. This question has been dealt with in numerous studies. And what they found is that strength is not the reason that people lose their balance. In other words, is weakness the main reason that people are falling? And the answer is no. When you look at strength, it turns out that someone needs enough strength to stand up against gravity, to be able to walk you know, a half a mile without falling down. If you have enough strength to do that, then strength is not your limiting factor. What studies have shown is that when you take people that are falling a lot and you give them a lot of different types of strengthening, I've seen studies that worked with Pilates, with CrossFit, with powerlifting. I mean, every kind of strength training that you can think of has been tested. 
there is not a significant reduction in falls in those people. And many people scratch their heads and wonder, why is that? Because we're taking someone that's weak and we're making them stronger. Why are they still falling? And the answer is because that's not the reason they're falling. They're not falling down because their muscles can't support them. They're falling down because they're using the wrong techniques when they walk. When they turn, they're crossing their foot over. Or when they walk backwards, they lack that program, that basic program of how to step backwards correctly. When they're walking forward, they're not lifting their foot high enough. They're tripping on things. There's a number of different technical things that someone can be doing wrong with their walking that predisposes them to falling. One of the biggest is maybe they're just afraid. So when they walk, they're very stiff. And when they try to negotiate over uneven terrain, they're stiff and they're doing the wrong technique because they're afraid they're going to fall and that actually causes them to fall. Study after study has shown that it's the programming, it's the technique that causes people to fall, not their strength. But that doesn't stop almost every fall prevention program from focusing on strength training. And I'm not saying that strength is unimportant. It's very important. As we get older, it's really important to try to maintain your strength and to include strength training in your daily routine. But lack of strength is not the reason that people fall. It's programming. And the way to improve your balance programming is to challenge yourself. The number two biggest misunderstanding is that walkers or canes make your balance worse. I hear this all the time. I talk to clients and I say, you know, you'd really benefit from using a walker or a cane to walk more steadily. And they go, oh no, I don't want to do that because I don't want my balance to get worse. There's a, a little analogy that I tell a lot of people. I ask them if they feel safer when they go to the food store pushing the shopping cart. When you're pushing the trolley and you're walking around the aisles in the grocery store, do you feel more steady? And you'd be surprised at how many people tell me that when they're pushing a shopping cart, they feel a lot more steady. They feel that they can they're more stable, they can pick their feet up better, they don't feel like they're gonna fall. But when they let go of the shopping cart, when they're not walking with that, they feel more unsteady. So I asked those people, then why don't you wanna use a walker? Why don't you wanna use a cane? And they always tell me, because they're afraid if they use that, they'll become dependent on it. So my argument is this, if you're not using a walker or a cane and you feel unstable when you walk, aren't you basically gonna walk a lot less? Someone that feels unsteady is not going to go for an exercise walk around their block and they're not going to walk throughout their house without grabbing on all the furniture. So in a sense, by feeling unsteady, they're actually limiting how much they're walking every day. There have been so many studies that have shown that in order to maintain the ability to walk, it comes down to how many steps you take. Perhaps you've heard of taking 5,000 steps a day or 10,000 steps a day and how important that is to maintaining your health. Well, maintaining your ability to walk requires you walking at least 2,000 steps a day. Many people that are afraid of walking or who have poor balance or, who are, or are very at risk for falling, they're walking maybe two to 300 steps a day. What that means is every day they're getting worse and worse because they're not taking enough steps. What a walker or a cane lets you do is to regain that confidence, regain that actual stability so that you can walk more. One way to think of a walker or a cane is it's a device that lets you get back to walking three to 5,000 steps and that's the ticket to getting rid of the walker or a cane. I've worked with many people that are having trouble walking, they're falling, they're stumbling, and I get them to use a walker or a cane and then they increase their gait distance on a daily basis and after a month or two, they're not using that walker anymore, which is great. I don't want anyone to have to use a walker, but if you're stumbling or falling or if you're limiting how much you're walking because you refuse to use that piece of equipment, you're actually making yourself worse. So it is a fallacy that using a walker or a cane makes you worse. I think it's true that people that have different disabilities like strokes or pain or orthopedic problems 
Yes, they use walkers or canes, but walkers or canes don't cause those problems. Walkers or canes are a tool that allow you to walk more steps per day, which is really the ticket to getting better and to, and to improving your balance and being more independent. The number one biggest misconception about balance is that older people should avoid challenge. I can't tell you how many times I've worked with doctors and healthcare professionals that will instruct their patients and the people that listen to them to avoid challenge because they want them to avoid falling. Study after study has shown that the way we improve our balance is through challenge. So the last thing you want to do if you're having trouble with your balance is to advise someone to not challenge themselves. What happens is if you stop challenging yourself in a few weeks or a few months, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you don't challenge yourself for that period of time, you definitely will lose your balance. You'll lose the ability to balance yourself. And then that doctor or whoever told you that can look at you and say, well, yep, see, I told you, you've, you've lost your ability to balance. What's important after you've had a fall or after you start to see a decline in your balance is to find a way to challenge your balance. The more you challenge your balance, the faster your balance will recover. So things like yoga, tai chi, pilates, dancing, um, going for a walk on a gravel road or on a beach, those are the things that actually can improve your balance. They're not things that you should avoid. I've worked with many people that are in their 80s, 90s, and even beyond that, can, that have improved their balance by challenging it in the ways I'm describing, by doing something like yoga or a dance class. People that avoid those types of activities, those are the ones that get worse and get worse very quickly. Usually it takes about two months of not challenging yourself before you're going to be chair ridden or even bed ridden. So it's very important when you start to lose your balance right away to start challenging it. Challenging it is the secret to getting it back again. And I've done this for 30 years and I've never seen an exception to that rule. No one's ever gotten their balance back sitting on a chair or restricting themselves from walking. You get your balance back by trying things that are challenging. Now that can vary from person to person. If you're at a very low level, then you need to start at a low level of challenge. But everyone can improve their balance at any age, but only through challenging activities. I hope you found this video helpful. If you want to see more videos like this, please subscribe to my channel. And if you would like to work with a therapist or trainer that's trained in the techniques that you just saw, they can go to proprioceptiverehab.com to get training from me in exactly how to do this. I offer a course in proprioceptive rehabilitation for physical therapists and personal trainers.